Matthews, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Maureen Gannon, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine and the Associate Dean for Faculty Development at Vanderbilt University. Maureen has had a distinguished career. She's a major leader in the fields of beta cell development and beta cell biology. Uh, she has also been a major leader um, in the context of a scientific leader for specifically with organizations like the ADA, where she has um, uh, led the American Diabetes Scientific Sessions um, previously. Uh, today, Maureen's going to talk about a, a topic that is very near and dear to most of us with uh, you know, sort of how do we make beta cells survive or come back uh, during pathogenic states. So Maureen, thanks for uh, visiting us virtually and we're looking forward to the seminar. All right, thank you so much, Clay. And, and I wanna thank you and, and Mark also for the invitation. I know this, um, this seminar has been rescheduled a couple times. Uh, and so I, I thank you for, for your patience with, with having to do that for various reasons. Um, but I'm finally glad to, to be here with all of you. And even though I wish I was there in person and hopefully we can do that someday at some point, one good thing about Zoom is that I know that there are people that are participating today that are not at the University of Florida. And so we wouldn't be able to do that um, if we didn't have Zoom. And so I am grateful for that. And I wanna thank all of you uh, who are here today. Um, I wanna thank you for being here and I look forward to your comments and questions at the end of the seminar. So my understanding is that all the questions are gonna be held at the end. So. Um, so, uh, you know, just write them down in case you, you forget. So, um, so I'm going to tell you two different stories today um, about two projects going on in the lab. And, um, and I wanted to highlight these stories um, for, for reasons that I hope will become clear in that the, I wanted you to appreciate the variety of the types of pathways that my lab is interested in looking at for ways that we can manipulate beta cell mass. And so either increasing the generation of beta cells during embryonic development or stimulating beta cell regeneration and proliferation or enhancing beta cell survival. And so those are all the types of questions that my lab is really interested in. And I wanna start off with a slide now, why is it not working? There we go, okay. Um, with a slide that I think all of you have seen, um, which is, um, I've looked for an updated map from the CDC, but this is the most recent that I've been able to find. But you, you've all seen these sorts of things where you can see that the percentage of, of diabetes incidence has been increasing over the, the last couple of decades. Um, and that this is really concentrated in the Southern part of the US. And this correlates um, not surprisingly with the incidence of obesity in the US as well. But one thing that I'm sure you're all aware of that I want us to think about at the onset of, of the seminar today is that not everyone who is obese goes on to develop type 2 diabetes. And there's probably a variety of reasons for that. But being a beta cell biologist, today I'm going to focus on what might be different in beta cell mass um, in different individuals. And so first I'm going to show you some um, data from several years ago from Peter Butler's lab. Uh, where he looked at beta cell mass in autopsy studies from humans who were lean or obese at the time of death. And I think you can see that overall that individuals who were obese have a larger beta cell mass. Now, if we break out the beta cell mass of these obese individuals into individuals who did not have diabetes, so non-diabetic, those who have uh, imp impaired fasting blood glucose, or those who had type two diabetes, you can see that individuals who did not have diabetes but who are obese, on average have a larger beta cell mass than those who have impaired fasting glucose or type two diabetes. Now, these are autopsy studies, as I said, so these are endpoint assays. And unfortunately, with the current um, technology that we have, there's no way to longitudinally in vivo measure somebody's beta cell mass over their lifetime. So we don't really know if these individuals who didn't develop diabetes were born with more beta cell mass or were able to compensate more for, for the obesity or whether these individuals with type two diabetes initially mounted a compensatory response and then underwent beta cell loss. 
So there's no way to assess this with our current technologies. Um, and so I really like this figure from a review article by Amelia Linneman from a few years ago, where she described the different ways that one could arrive at this discrepancy between normal beta cell mass and this decrease in beta cell mass we see with individuals who have type 2 diabetes. And I want us to think about a few different mechanisms that could lead to that ultimate discrepancy in beta cell mass. So first of all, you could imagine that could be, there could be developmental differences. So things that happen in utero, um, either you know, due to epigenetic programming or slight changes in gene expression and genes that are um, important for the development of beta cells during organogenesis. Um, but for whatever um, the reason, it could be that some individuals are born with less beta cell mass than other individuals. And that that beta cell mass is enough to maintain euglycemia until those individuals become older or gain weight or become more sedentary. And then with the onset of obesity and insulin resistance, that amount of beta cell mass is insufficient to maintain euglycemia. Another mechanism could be failure of adaptation or compensation. So we know in mouse models, for example, that if you put mice on a high fat diet or rats on a high fat diet, there's an increase in beta cell proliferation and an increase in beta cell mass. And it could be that in some individuals that compensatory response fails or doesn't happen adequately leading to that discrepancy in beta cell mass that leads to type two diabetes. And another alternative is that beta cell development is fine, beta cell compensation is initially fine, but in some individuals, they are more susceptible to beta cell loss when they are faced with glucolipotoxicity or an increased demand for insulin secretion that happens with insulin resistance. And there's either beta cell death or de differentiation leading to this discrepancy in beta cell mass that we see in autopsy studies. Regardless of the etiology, the end point is the same, this decrease in beta cell mass in individuals who have type 2 diabetes. And so one of the things that we and many other labs are interested in looking at is whether increasing functional beta cell mass could prevent or reverse diabetes. And so as I mentioned to you at the onset of the seminar, I'm going to talk about two different projects going on in the lab. And the first project I'm going to talk to you about is involved with these potential developmental biology issues that could lead to a decrease in functional beta cell mass in some individuals. So um, this story begins with two transcription factors that my lab and, and many others have been studying for many years. I started working on the PDX1 transcription factor as a postdoctoral fellow in Chris Wright's lab at Vanderbilt, um, and then started working on OC1 at the end of my time in Chris's lab and took that project on with me when I started my own lab. Um, and these two transcription factors are very well known in their role in pancreas development. So what you're looking at here on the left side of the slide is um, a very early pancreatic bud in the mouse, embryonic day 11 and a half. And at this point, there's no branching, there's no exocrine cells, there's no uh, endocrine cells. Um, but at this point, these um, cells here that are labeled for both PDX and OC1 are called multipotent pancreatic progenitor cells, and they could give rise to any cell type in the mature pancreas. And what I want you to notice is that PDX1 and OC1, these two transcription factors, are co-expressed in these multipotent pancreatic progenitors. However, they have divergent expressions as development proceeds. Um, we know from studies in Chris Wright's lab and Helena Edlin's lab that um, mice with uh, null mutation in PDX are born lacking a pancreas. So PDX1 is absolutely essential for pancreas development. So here you can see the digestive organs from a wild type or a control animal and the PDX1 null animal. And here outlined um, in the white area here is the pancreas. And you can see these animals are completely lacking a pancreas. And there have been humans born with null mutations in PDX1. They have the same phenotype. They are apancreatic. Now, PDX1 in adult pancreas is only expressed in the beta cells. And so you can see here in green, this nice PDX1 expression in the beta cells. It's in a few cells in the exocrine tissue, but for the most part, it's only in the beta cells. And PDX1 as a transcription factor regulates many genes. Um, and these include things like insulin, GLUT2, glucokinase, a lot of genes that we know are important for mature beta cell function. Um, PDX1 heterozygous mice and humans 
go on to develop impaired glucose tolerance. And that's shown in this figure here. So this is a glucose tolerance test from mice. You can see in red are the PDX1 heterozygous animals and they have impaired glucose tolerance. In contrast, OC1 um, in the null animals doesn't lead to complete loss of the pancreas. It results in pancreatic hypoplasia, so just a smaller pancreas. And so that's what you're looking at down here. These are control embryos at embryonic day 14 and a half. And in, um, the pancreatic epithelium is labeled with PDX1 and glucagon in green. So you can see how big the pancreas is supposed to be. Um, but in the OC1 null animals, you can see that there's a smaller pancreas, but, but the cell types are still there. However, if we look at birth in OC1 mutants, and this was work done by Frederick Lemaire's group several years ago, you can see there's a dramatic reduction in the number of insulin producing cells, as well as the other endocrine cell types in the pancreas. So the absence of OC1 results in a, almost a complete loss of the endocrine cells. And this is due to the role that OC1 plays in regulating endocrine differentiation through its regulation of the transcription factor neurogenin-3. Unlike PDX, which is expressed in the beta cells in the adult pancreas, OC1 is mainly found in the ducts and in the acinar cells in the adult pancreas. And actually, once hormone expression initiates during embryonic development, OC1 expression gets turned off. So the only time that PDX1 and OC1 are co-expressed in the developing pancreas is in this multipotent pancreatic progenitor stage that I'm showing you here on the left. Dara Stauffer's group showed several years ago that PDX1 and OC1 interact on the, um, on the promoter of neurogenin-3 to regulate neurogenin-3 expression. And that's shown here in this reporter assay where PDX1 and HNF6 together have an increased ability to activate neurogenin-3 um, expression than either transcription factor alone or any of these other factors. Um, that are also known to regulate neurogenin-3. So PDX1 and HNF6 cooperate, they physically interact, and they regulate endocrine differentiation. But again, it's in that multipotent pancreatic progenitor stage, and after neurogenin-3 is activated, PDX1 stays on in the endocrine lineage, and HNF6 or OC1 is turned off. So we've been collaborating with Doris um, for about 10 years now, um, looking at how PDX1 and OC1 regulate endocrine differentiation um, and how they genetically and physically interact. And one of the classic genetic experiments that we did several years ago was to look at um, embryos that are doubly heterozygous for PDX1 and OC1 to see whether they act in the same pathway genetically to um, influence differentiation of endocrine cells. And so what you're looking at down here are sections of pancreata from embryonic day 15 and a half embry mouse embryos. Um, you have controls here on the far left, PDX1 and OC1 single heterozygotes, and then animals that are double heterozygous for PDX1 and OC1. And what you can see is that there's a decrease in the number of neurogenin-3 positive cells, and those are the endocrine progenitors, in the animals that are doubly heterozygous for PDX1 and OC1. So what's important to remember here is that each of the single heterozygotes, so PDX1 heterozygotes and OC1 heterozygotes, have normal endocrine development. They're born with the normal number of endocrine cells, um, and until PDX1 heterozygotes get older, they maintain euglycemia. So the combination of a loss of one allele of each of these transcription factors results in about a 50% decrease in endocrine differentiation. Um, and so that was uh, unexpected to us. And so we wanted to look and see what genes PDX1 and OC1 might be regulating in the endocrine differentiation program besides neurogenin-3. And so we looked at single heterozygotes and double heterozygotes at embryonic day 15 and a half, and we performed whole pancreas RNA sequencing. And what we expected was that the genes that would be differentially regulated in the double hets would be a combination of the genes that were differentially regulated in the single heterozygotes. And that's not what we found. We found that there were 153 genes that are specifically differentially regulated in the double heterozygotes compared to each of the single heterozygotes alone.
And when we did an analysis of what these genes were, it was most of the genes that are involved in endocrine differentiation. So you can see here, insulin was downregulated, somatostatin, glucagon, neurogenin-3, and lots of genes, transcription factors like MAP-A, PAC-6, and KX6.1, things that are known to regulate beta cell differentiation. So um, we looked then after the animals were born to see if there was any rescue of this phenotype and we saw persistent decrease in expression of insulin and glucagon. And then we looked at postnatal day 14 and we saw still decrease in different transcription factors like MAF-A and KX6.1 and PAX4 that are all really important for beta cell differentiation and maturation. In addition, we looked at expression of functional genes that are involved in insulin secretion, such as um, these here on the right-hand side, and um, insulin, uh, sorry, uh, glucokinase and components of the um, potassium channel that are also important for insulin secretion. So even though these two transcription factors are only co-expressed in the multipotent pancreatic progenitor cells, and there has been a long window of time between that point and this postnatal day 14, you can see that there's a persistent defect in endocrine differentiation in these double heterozygous animals. So to summarize what we found in the RNA-seq, we found that genes that are important for beta cell identity were downregulated, such as these transcription factors listed here, that genes important for glucose sensitivity like GLUT2 and glucokinase were decreased, um, genes involved in depolarization that are important for insulin secretion, and also things that are involved in insulin processing and the phys physical um, fusion of the insulin granules with the plasma membrane. So all of these genes were downregulated in the double heterozygous animals, and it suggested that there's ongoing impairments in beta cell function as well as beta cell number. So we also then look to see whether there was an effect of double heterozygosity on beta cell compensation. And I showed you earlier in the introduction that in the mouse, when you put them on high fat diet, there's an increase in beta cell mass and that's usually through beta cell proliferation. And so we wanted to see if there were any impacts of having lost one allele of each of PDX1 and OC1 on beta cell compensation in response to high fat diet. And I think you can see nicely in this pancreas section here, um, where the insulin is in brown and the exocrine tissue is labeled with eosin, you can see that the double heterozygous animals that were put on high fat diet um, have a reduced beta cell mass. And so you can see much fewer insulin positive cells here. And when we quantified beta cell proliferation, we saw nice increases in beta cell proliferation in the control animals and in each of the single heterozygotes, but we failed to see an increase in beta cell proliferation in the double heterozygotes. So again, this was quite surprising to us. Um, remember, OC1 has not been expressed in these cells for a very long time. Uh, once insulin transcription turned on, OC1 gets turned off. But there's a lasting persistent defect in beta cell function, beta cell maturation, and also beta cell compensation. So just to summarize what I've told you so far, PDX1 and OC1 seem to cooperate in the multipancreatic progenitor cells to regulate endocrine specification, activation of neurogenin-3, and differentiation. And that reductions, oh, I, didn't, I didn't show you this one actually, um, the second bullet point. So we found that reductions in endocrine differentiation were partially compensated for by an increase in beta cell proliferation right before birth. Um, but that's not, in, that's not sufficient to uh, regenerate normal beta cell mass. Um, there's also um, a persistent defect in beta cell gene expression that goes out to weaning, um, and there's a persistent defect in function postnatally. And we also found that this reduced PDX1 and OC1 in multipancreatic progenitor cells impairs the ability of beta cells to compensate in response to high fat diet when they are adults. So what this suggests is that slight defects or differences in levels of expression and function of beta cell differentiation factors and genes that are involved in beta cell development during embryogenesis could predispose one to developing type two diabetes later on in life by either impairing beta cell function 
or by leading to an impaired ability to compensate for insulin resistance and high fat diet exposure um, when one becomes older. So more recently with DARS, we've started to collaborate to try and figure out um, how PDX1 and OC1 are having their effects on transcription um, and whether or not there are persistent epigenetic changes that are laid down by these two transcription factors early in development that might then regulate genes that need to be expressed later on in life. Um, and so what I'm showing you in this cartoon here are genes that have been identified in the human PDX1 gene, I'm sorry, uh, mutations identified in the human PDX1 gene that lead to diabetes in people. And so PDX1 is um, also a MODI gene. Um, Dara Stoffer showed that when she did her postdoctoral work with Joel Habener many years ago. Um, and so, as you know, the MODI genes are monogenic forms of diabetes and MODI stands for maturity onset diabetes of the young and PDX1 is MODI4. And so there have been several mutations that have been identified that lead to monogenic diabetes in individuals with these mutations. Um, there are also mutations, as I mentioned early on, that lead to pancreatic agenesis, and those are normally found that lead to truncations early on in the protein. Um, but you can see here in this C-terminal region, uh, which has been not very well characterized. So this homeo domain is the DNA binding domain, and this transactivation domain has been very well characterized and interacts with P300 and other co-activators co of transcription. But this end, this end domain here at the C-terminal hasn't really been characterized very well. And there are several, several mutations that are known to lead to type 2 diabetes in humans in this region. And it's this region through which OC1 or HNF6 interacts. Um, and that's been shown by Doris in her lab. In addition, Doris has also shown that this same region interacts with this factor called PSIF, which is the name that she gave it when she discovered it, but it's also known as SPOP. And so um, one of the things that we've been working on to try and figure out is what is the role of this C-terminal and the interactions of these two proteins, OC1 and SPOP, um, with regulating PDX1 function. So several years ago, um, Doris's lab uh, generated a C-terminal truncation version of the PDX1 protein where that interaction domain with OC1 and SPOP is missing. Um, and it's called the Delta C mutant. And um, what she found was that the pancreas overall looked pretty normal size, uh, but that when she quantified the number of neurogenin-3 positive cells, that they were reduced in these mutants. And so you can see um, as development progresses, so at embryonic day 13 and a half, 15 and a half, and 17 and a half, um, in these C-terminal uh, homozygous mutants, there's a decrease in the number of neurogenin-3 positive cells, so a decrease in endocrine progenitors. Um, and so what we're looking at now is the role of SPOP and OC1 in regulating PDX1 activity and function. And just to give you a little bit more information about SPOP, um, as I said, it's also called PSIF, which stands for PDX1 C-terminal interacting factor. Um, and what we found is that um, heterozygosity for this uh, gene SPOP or PSIF, when you combine that with PDX1 heterozygosity, actually can improve that glucose tolerance defect. So if you remember in the introduction, I showed you that PDX1 heterozygotes, as they get older, have impaired glucose tolerance. Well, if you now combine that with SPOP or PSIF heterozygosity, you can actually prevent that impairment in glucose tolerance. So it suggests that SPOP is actually a negative regulator of PDX1. Um, and so uh, in agreement with that, what Doris's lab has found was that if they overexpress SPOP along with PDX1 in uh, 293 T cells, that that results in PDX1 ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation. So this is our current working model of how SPOP or PSIF and OC1 um, regulate PDX. So we think that this is a mutually exclusive interaction of PDX1 and OC1 uh, with SPOP to regulate PDX1 function and stability. And so within this C-terminal region, if OC1 interacts with that region, PDX1 becomes stabilized and phosphorylated and is able to activate transcription of its known target genes in cooperation with OC1 and thus 
initiate and sustain the endocrine differentiation program. However, in the presence of binding with SPOP, PDX1 is targeted for ubiquitination and degradation. So it's going to be the balance of these two PDX1 interacting proteins that's going to determine the levels of PDX1 and also the activity of PDX1. And so those are the experiments that we're doing now. We're trying to play with the levels of OC1 and SPOP and look at how that affects PDX1 levels and activity. So with that, I'm going to move on to the second part of the story. So I told you one way that we could have a reduction in beta cell mass that could lead to type 2 diabetes later in life is if there are defects in endocrine development and that that could be due to just slight decreases and not necessarily complete, complete losses in important beta cell development transcription factors such as PDX1 and OC1. I also showed you that um, reductions in PDX1 and OC1 can also affect beta cell compensation. So this failure of adaptation could be due to events that happen early on in development and not actually that's something that's happening in the individual at that time. Now I'm going to switch to another project going on in the lab where we've been really focusing more on beta cell proliferation and beta cell survival. And so um, as many of you know, and, and as some of the people um, here on the Zoom call also are involved in, there are lots of different stimuli that can promote beta cell proliferation um, in adults, especially in mice, but also in humans. Um, and these include things like injury, high glucose, um, different hormones, particularly those involved in pregnancy. Those are known to stimulate um, maternal beta cell mass expansion and also different growth factors and neurotransmitters. All of these different things will increase beta cell proliferation. Um, and my lab has been looking at the role of this transcription factor, FOXM1, downstream of these proliferative stimuli to enhance beta cell proliferation and beta cell mass. And we've shown that FOXM1 expression is upregulated in response to beta cell proliferative stimuli, and that FOXM1 is required for beta cell proliferation in adult beta cells. One of the things that became interesting to us several years ago was that in both mice and humans, FOXM1 expression in beta cells decreases with age. And that's really interesting because as all of you know, the incidence of type two diabetes in the population increases with age and the ability of beta cells to proliferate decreases with age. So this is data that you're looking at here from human autopsy studies. And you can see that there's a precipitous decline in the ability of beta cells to proliferate once you get past about age 10. So this reduction in FOXM1 expression in beta cells as we age could be contributing to this inability of beta cells to re-enter the cell cycle. And that could impair one's ability maybe to in increase beta cell mass in response to weight gain, insulin resistance, or a sedentary lifestyle as we get older. So one of the questions we asked several years ago was whether or not reactivation of FOXM1 in older beta cells could rejuvenate them to behave more like younger beta cells and restore proliferation. In order to do that, we generated a doxycycline-inducible FOXM1 overexpression model where FOXM1 could be expressed in response to doxycycline in the drinking water only in the beta cells. Um, and so what you're looking at here, similar to what I showed you earlier, are tissue sections um, from pancreata. And again, the insulin is in brown and the rest of the pancreatic tissue is in pink with eosin. And what we did here was to take animals that were 12 months old and to put doxycycline in the drinking water for two weeks to activate FOXM1. And these are the beta FOXM1 mice. And you can see very nicely, we have an increase in insulin area in the pancreases from these animals. And that's quantified here. And so what you can appreciate is that if we induce FOXM1 expression in beta cells of mice that are two months old, there's no increase in beta cell mass. And we think that this is because FOXM1 is not limiting in these, um, in these animals at this age. There's plenty of FOXM1 and proliferation is fine um, and increasing FOXM1 has no effect. However, as the animals get older, when we induce FOXM1 expression for two weeks 
at four months of age or eight months of age or 12 months of age, you can see we get a nice increase in beta cell mass. And this is due to an increase in beta cell proliferation. We also treated the FOXM1 overexpressing mice with um, streptozotocin and found that FOXM1 induction protected against STZ mediated beta cell death. And if we put these islets overexpressing FOXM1 in culture and treated them with cytokines, it also protected against cytokine mediated beta cell death. So FOXM1 activation can enhance beta cell mass by increasing proliferation and also protecting against beta cell death. So in order to try and figure out what genes FOXM1 might be regulating, we performed RNA sequencing on the islets from animals in which we had induced FOXM1 expression for two weeks. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the different um, genes that were changed, but two of the genes that popped out as really exciting to us were these two prostaglandin receptors, EP3 and EP4. And these are G protein coupled receptors. Um, and so in all the cartoons you're going to see, um, you'll see that EP3 is in red and EP4 is in green. Um, and that is because activation of EP3 by its ligand, prostaglandin E2, stimulates GI coupled proteins and that would inhibit adenylate cyclase and result in a decrease in cyclic AMP. PGE2 is also the ligand for the EP4 receptor. Um, however, EP4 is coupled to a GS protein so that would um, activate adenocyclase and increase cyclic AMP. So these two receptors in many other cell types have been shown to act in opposition to one another. They both bind PGE2 with equal affinity. So the outcome of PGE2 signaling is going to depend on which receptor is present in a greater amount in that particular cell type. And in both obesity and type two diabetes, circulating PGE2 and locally produced PGE2 within the islet is elevated. And so this was really interesting to us that FOXM1 overexpression resulted in a decrease in EP3 and an increase in EP4, knowing what we knew about how these two receptors reciprocally um, affect cyclic AMP production, this um, role of FOXM1 in altering their expression was very interesting to us. We also knew from work done in Michelle Kimple's lab at the University of Wisconsin that the EP3 mRNA is increased in human and mouse um, islets from, from human and mice with type 2 diabetes. And also Michelle had shown that a GI coupled G protein called G-alpha-Z that is able to couple with EP3, if it is knocked out, you get increased beta cell proliferation and beta cell mass. And so we've been working with Michelle's group to um, unroll the, the to unravel the role of EP3 and EP4 um, in the beta cell in proliferation and survival. The other thing that was known when we started these studies was that EP4 agonists, when given to mice treated with STZ, could improve survival of the mice. Now they didn't look at whether or not that improved beta cell survival, but the mice survived better if they were treated with EP4 agonists. And the same is true for this type two diabetes model, the DBDB mouse model, if they're treated with EP4 agonists, that improves glucose homeostasis. So this was um, what was known at the time that we found that these two genes were reciprocally regulated by FOXM1 overexpression. Now, of course, these are not the only two G protein coupled receptors that are expressed in beta cells. There's actually a couple of hundred different G protein coupled receptors that are expressed in beta cells. Two of them are ones that I'm sure are very familiar to all of you. Um, one is the somatostatin receptor, which is coupled to GI and would therefore inhibit cyclic AMP. And it's well known for its role in inhibiting insulin secretion. The other one that's probably well known to you is the incretin receptor. So the GLP-1 receptor is a GS coupled, G protein coupled receptor. And that would do the opposite, would increase cyclic AMP and increase insulin secretion. So when we think about G protein coupled receptor function in beta cells, it's going to be the sum of these um, positively and negatively activating receptors that are going to affect beta cell function and proliferation. So one of the things that we predicted was that since EP3 is downregulated when we overexpress FOXM1 and that EP3 would be um, negatively impacting cyclic AMP and therefore potentially beta cell proliferation, 
we thought that if we looked at animals lacking EP3, we would see an increase in beta cell proliferation. So in collaboration with Rich Breyer at Vanderbilt, who had generated EP3 null mice, um, we looked at the role of EP3 on beta cell proliferation in high fat diet. So normally when you put animals on high fat diet, you get this nice increase in beta cell proliferation. Um, and we expected that the EP3 null animals would have an increase in beta cell proliferation on a chow diet, and that this would even be further enhanced when they were put on a high fat diet. And that's not what we saw. So you can see that the EP3 null animals with four weeks of high fat diet have no increase in beta cell proliferation. And they have about the same amount of beta cell proliferation increase when put on high fat diet as the wild type animals. And this was surprising to us. It's not what we had predicted, um, but we thought a little bit about it and we thought that maybe EP3 on its own doesn't have an effect on proliferation, but that it needs an additional stimulus. And we knew from work done in our lab previously and Laura Alonzo's lab, that four weeks of high fat diet is not enough for the animals to become insulin resistant. That usually happens after five weeks on the diet. So we put the animals on a high fat diet for a longer period of time. And now you can see that when the null animals are put on high fat diet, they have an increase in beta cell proliferation compared to the other groups. So that led us to this hypothesis that we've been working with. That EP3 and EP4 play opposing roles in regulating beta cell proliferation and beta cell mass expansion, but that they act as rheostats in the presence of another stimulus. So you need an initial stimulus for proliferation, in this case, insulin resistance, and that EP3, if activated by PGE2, would turn this signal down, and that if EP4 were activated by PGE2, it would turn the signal up. And so this is the, the um, working model that we've been trying to dissect. So in order to do that, initially what we've done is we've gotten um, cadaver donor human islets from the IIDP, as well as we've done some studies with wild type mouse islets, and we've cultured them in the presence of um, modulators of EP3 and EP4 activity. And so I will have um, on the left-hand side of all this slides for the next few slides, this little cheat sheet of which compounds you're looking at. So DGO41 is our EP3 antagonist and sulprostone is the agonist that we've been using. We don't use PGE2 because it would also hit EP4 and sulprostone is much more selective for EP3. So our normal stimulus for mouse beta cell proliferation is the pregnancy hormone placental lactogen. You can see we get a nice increase in beta cell proliferation in these isolated mouse islets in culture. When we co-administer this EP3 agonist, sulprostone, you can see we lose the beneficial effects of placental lactogen. If we add the EP3 antagonist alone, just like we saw with the null animals on the high fat diet, there's no effect of losing EP3 or inhibiting EP3 on its own. There's no stimulation of beta cell proliferation. But if we do that in combination, with a proliferative stimulus like placental lactogen, you can see we get a further increase in beta cell proliferation over placental lactogen alone, suggesting again that modulation of EP3 and EP4 activity acts as a dial up or dial down, not an on and off switch. We see a similar sort of thing when we look at whether or not um, inhibiting EP3 or activating EP4 can stimulate human beta cell proliferation. Placental lactogen doesn't work in humans. Um, so the placental lactogen receptor goes down with age. These are islets from individuals in their 50s and 60s. So placental lactogen does not work on, on human islets of this age. However, we did see an increase um, in beta cell proliferation with DGO41 treatment alone, um, and a further increase when we co-treated with the EP4 agonist, um, this K compound. And at first we were surprised about that because I just told you a minute ago that we think that these act as a rheostat, not an on or off switch. But then we realized that we culture our human islets in 11 millimolar glucose and we culture our mouse islets in five millimolar glucose. And so we think that the stimulus of 11 millimolar glucose is acting like the primary signal, the on switch. 
and then either inhibiting EP3 or activating EP4 can dial that up. Importantly, we never see any stimulation of alpha cell proliferation in mouse or human islets with any of these compounds. Um, and that's important because in other, um, other compounds such as the DERK1A inhibitors that, have, that are um, under active study right now by several groups, that those um, inhibitors actually stimulate both alpha and beta cell proliferation. Um, and when we treat either with DGO41 or with K, uh, we don't see any activation of alpha cell proliferation. And so we think that that's very important that we seem to only be affecting the beta cells. And these receptors are expressed on alpha cells and beta cells. We've also looked um, to see whether or not modulation of EP3 and EP4 activity can affect beta cell survival. And so we've been culturing mouse and human beta cells in this cytokine cocktail that's used by many groups. I'm sure many of you um, on, the, on the call right now use these as well. Um, and so again, you can see what the different compounds are on the left-hand side here. Um, so what we, what we did was to culture mouse islets either in the absence of cytokines or in the presence of cytokines. And you can see that cytokine treatment results in an increase in beta cell death. When we inhibit EP3, we um, see now that that's protective against cytokine mediated beta cell death. And the same thing when we activate EP4, the beta cells are protected against death. Um, I told you in vivo that the, the beta cells overexpressing FOXM1 are protected from STZ, and you can see that here in culture, they're also protected from cytokine-mediated beta cell death. Um, when we activate EP3 or inhibit EP4, we lose the protective effect of FOXM1 overexpression on beta cell death. So it suggests that that uh, reciprocal um, uh, regulation of EP3 and EP4 by FOXM1 that, I, that led us into this whole line of research to begin with, that that's really critical for FOXM1 to be able to maintain beta cell survival, that it's um, down regulation of EP3 and up regulation of EP4 is what is resulting in this beta cell survival. We've also looked at human beta cell survival, and again, inhibition of EP3 um, is deleterious, I'm sorry, activation of EP3 is deleterious um, to beta cells, but when we inhibit EP3 or activate EP4, you can see that human beta cells are also protected in the presence of cytokines. So it suggests that the pathways through which EP3 and EP4 are acting in the beta cell are conserved between mouse and human. And so I'm just gonna summarize what I've just told you. So we, we've shown that FOXM1 reciprocally regulates EP3 and EP4, and that these two receptors have opposite effects in the beta cell with EP3 activity would inhibit beta cell proliferation and EP4 activity activates beta cell proliferation. EP3 is upregulated in the setting of aging, inflammation, and diabetes whereas FOXM1 is downregulated in those same situations. And so we're now looking to see what are some of the downstream pathways through which EP3 and EP4 have their effects on beta cell proliferation and survival. And we have some evidence that that may be through phospholipase C gamma and PKA. We've also started to move into in vivo models. So everything I've shown you so far with the EP3 and EP4 compounds was in human and mouse islets in ex vivo culture. Um, and so we wanted to see whether or not treatment in vivo in, in the setting of type two diabetes could improve beta cell compensation or improve beta cell function. Um, and so we've been using this DBDB model, which is not an ideal model. It's a monogenic form of type two diabetes. And so it doesn't really recapitulate how humans normally get type two diabetes, but it's a very well characterized model. Um, and so in particular, very nice work from Roland Stein's lab at Vanderbilt has, um, has elucidated the timeline of beta cell failure in this mouse model. And so you can see at four weeks of age, there's a lot of proliferation going on in the beta cells as marked by KI67, and that this decreases um, as the animals get older, and that's quantified here. So there's this window in the DVDB model where beta cells attempt to compensate for the increased obesity, but you can see that that ultimately fails. And so with this knowledge, we um, developed this model where we've been treating 
wild type animals, DB heterozygotes or DBDB homozygous animals during that window of four to six weeks of age. And we've been treating them with the EP3 antagonist or the EP4 agonist for two weeks and then looking at beta cell proliferation and mass. And I should tell you from the outset, we don't see any difference in glucose tolerance or insulin tolerance with this duration and regimen of treatment, unfortunately. Um, but I just wanted to be upfront with that. Um, but we do see an effect on beta cell proliferation. And so that's shown here. So on the left-hand side is beta cell proliferation and on the right-hand side is alpha cell proliferation. And just like I told you ex vivo, we don't see any effects on alpha cell proliferation at all. Um, in the DBDB homozygous animals, we see a nice increase in beta cell proliferation when we treat with the EP3 inhibitor. Uh, we see a trend in the heterozygotes, but it's not significant. And importantly, we see no effect in the wild type animals. Again, going with that idea that the modulation of these receptors acts as a rheostat and not an on and off switch. So if you're euglycemic and your beta cells are fine and they're not stressed out in any way, treatment with this EP3 antagonist would have no effect. So it's only in the situation of beta cell stress where there's an effect. We also see a nice increase in beta cell mass um, when we treat these animals for two weeks with um, the EP3 antagonist. So that correlates nicely with the proliferation that we see and no change in alpha cell mass. Um, we didn't see any change in beta cell survival at least with this regimen of treatment that we've been using. So again, all of this fits so far very nicely with our model that I've been reiterating throughout this uh, part of the presentation. Um, so now we've really become interested, <coughs> excuse me, in what genes might be um, changed in response to EP3 antagonism that are leading to these changes in beta cell proliferation and beta cell mass. So we've done some RNA sequencing on whole islets from the DB heterozygotes and the DBDB homozygotes. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I just wanted to point out that a lot of genes, including transcription factors that are really important for beta cell maturation and function were downregulated, um, including PDX, which we talked about in the first half of the talk. And then some genes that are associated with beta cell immaturity were upregulated. Um, so the EP3 receptor was actually upregulated in the DBDB islets. Um, lactate dehydrogenase, which is a beta cell disallowed gene, um, is, is upregulated in DBDB islets. OC1, which I told you in the first half of the talk, is not expressed in insulin producing cells, is upregulated. So that's definitely a marker of immaturity, as is MAFB. So we look to see whether or not treatment with the EP3 antagonist could um, rescue or reverse some of these gene expression changes. And so we're, we're in the process of repeating this right now. We just got the results back, but haven't analyzed them yet. Because you can see, unfortunately, this one mouse didn't respond at all to the EP3 antagonist. But two of the three, you can see, had a nice reversal um, in a lot of the genes that I just showed you were um, decreased in the DBDB animals compared to the DB heterozygotes. And um, another thing we observed was that treatment with the EP3 antagonist restored normal islet architecture. So in many mouse models of type two diabetes, you get this mixed islet phenotype where the alpha cells shown here in white um, penetrate the core of the islet and treatment with the EP3 antagonist restored normal islet architecture. One of the genes that um, jumped out at us that we became really interested in, um, and we've now established a collaboration with Don Scott at Mount Sinai, was this transcription factor NRF2. And NRF2 is involved in the antioxidant pathway. So it's a master regulator of genes that are involved in antioxidants. Um, and a lot of these genes here that are also upregulated are target genes of NRF2. And so we sent some of our slides from our animals to Don at Mount Sinai and Leora Katz, a postdoc in his lab, performed immunolabeling and showed that there's an increase in nuclear NRF2 in animals from all of the genotypes when they're treated with the EP3 antagonist. And so this was really interesting to us because Don's group had already shown that CHREBP which uh, stimulates beta cell proliferation, activates NRF2 expression. And other groups had shown that overexpression of NRF2 in beta cells induces antioxidant genes and can rescue the DBDB phenotype. 
So we think that maybe this um, inhibition of EP3 is working through NRF2 to enhance beta cell function. And so that's the model that we are working with now. And we're trying to connect all the dots and see how inhibition of EP3 or activation of EP4 is leading to upregulation of proliferation and survival genes, as well as antioxidant genes. Um, and so with that, I want to thank all the members of my lab, both my current lab members who are listed here and former lab members who worked on this project. Um, this is the way we get together now, um, just as we're doing here today. So this is my most recent lab group photo uh, at a recent lab meeting. Um, and so I have uh, Ashley, Darian, and Shannon are my graduate students. Um, Valerie and Jen are research assistants. Karen is a postdoc and Xiaodong is a staff scientist in the lab. And so I'm very grateful to all of them for their hard work and perseverance through this pandemic. Um, I wanna also thank my collaborators. I've tried to mention all of them um, throughout the talk. The ILAP Procurement and Analysis Corps at Vanderbilt is outstanding. I know some of you work with them and, and you know that. Um, Marcella Brejova and Anastasia Coldren are just terrific. We couldn't do these experiments without them. Um, my funding, most of this work has been funded uh, by the VA that I've told you about today. And the, the first half of the talk was funded by the NIDDK. Um, and then I really wanna thank the IIDP and the ILA donors and their families without whom we also could not do these experiments. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that any of you might have. Thank you. Oops. Martin, this is Clay. Did you unmute everyone? Yes, everyone can uh, unmute themselves right now if they would like to ask questions. I have a question. This is Harry Nick, if that's okay. I just wanted to point out that we've been looking at RNA levels in uh, type one pancreas from the NPOD cohort and NRF2 is induced about 10.6 fold in, in the type one pancreas, just total. We don't, it's not specific anywhere just for your own um, knowledge. And then um, also we have induction about three fold of uh, SOD2. And if you connect uh, TP, TP53 or P53, that's also induced about six fold in, from an antioxidant regulation standpoint in human islets. The other question I had was in relation to, there's a recent paper that came out in Nature Communications on a protein that I didn't really know very much about until I read the paper called Kindlin2. And it, it, it talks about the fact that it, it modulates MAFA and beta catenin uh, expression and, and affects beta cell function and mass. So it, it supposedly, Kindlin is a protein that's intracellular, but it's involved in integrin um, um, uh, uh, extracellular matrix interaction. And the way I got involved, uh, interested in it was there's a paper indicating that it may, um, Kindlin 3, there's three different of these proteins. Kindlin 3 is involved in uh, um, suppressing leukemia in, uh, in the Philadelphia chromosome. And so through a, and that, that was where my question goes, through a niche in the bone marrow where these bone marrow stem cells kind of exist and the leukemia goes out of that. Is that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a developmental person, but in, in the, in the, in the um, pancreas, you showed that early uh, cluster of cells. Is, is that also viewed as a, as a niche or, and then the other question being that in, in a more, in an adult pancreas, would you, what's your feelings about how that might exist in, for example, duct epithelial cells? You're, you're, you're muted. Thank you. I thought I, I didn't know I was muted. Sorry about that. Um, I wanna thank you for alerting me to that paper. I'm gonna go look that up. I was not familiar with that. Um, so so with, in that multipotent pancreatic progenitor um, uh, situation, yes, I think that that, is, that could be considered a niche. Um, the location of the stem cells in the developing pancreas changes with time. So as the pancreas starts to undergo branching morphogenesis and becomes looking more like a tree and like a branched epithelium, 
the, um, the multipotent pancreatic progenitors move to the tips of the branches. And so that becomes like a secondary niche. Um, and they're signaling uh, pathways that are known to be important for that. And the mesenchyme, which would be in more close association with those tips as they grow out than it would be with the more internal aspect of the developing pancreas. The mesenchyme is really important for maybe maintaining that niche and sending signals that stimulate proliferation and ongoing stemness. Um, in the adult pancreas, um, this has been controversial for many, many, many years, whether or not there are um, stem cells that still reside. You know, some people talk about the central acinar cell as a potential stem cell. Um, there's evidence that the ductal epithelium could act potentially as a facultative stem cell um, and, and revert back to a more stem cell-like state when um, put under great stress to do so. Um, so I don't, I think that there's no evidence for a dedicated stem cell in the adult pancreas at this time, um, but that has been controversial for many years. Um, getting back to the integrins though, um, it's been shown by Vincenzo Cerulli's group that beta-1 integrin is really important for beta cell proliferation during embryonic development and also um, in maternal islets during pregnancy. Um, so definitely that, that interaction with the extracellular matrix um, and that, that inside out signaling, you might say, uh, is really important for beta cell proliferation, um, both in development and in the adult. I don't thank know if that answers all your questions, but thank that's you for great. that. Thank you. Rohit had a question. Rohit? Yeah, that's a great uh, talk, Maureen. It uh, transmitted very well all the way from Vanderbilt to Boston via Miami. So that, that, that's great. Awesome. Well, I don't think they're in Miami, but. Sorry, in Florida. No, James. <laughs> <so. laughs> anyway, it's so good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, so I had a couple of questions to the two parts, very brief questions. The first one was a fascinating concept that you could have a reduced uh, potential beta cell mass defect during, during early stages. So have you guys addressed that in a little bit more detail? For example, uh, re-express OC1 in adults and see whether uh, it could rescue the effect or some kind of a rescue experiment which could be done. Uh, that's, so that's the first one. The second one is the EP3 data are fascinating. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have an effect in the DV mouse, do you think could be due to uh, crosstalk with the leptin receptor because the DV mice uh, have a leptin receptor mutation? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So thank you for those questions. Um, so the first question, so OC1 is, um, as I said, gets downregulated as the beta cells differentiate. And so one of the questions that I actually asked several years ago when I was with Chris as a postdoc was whether or not that downregulation of OC1 was important in the beta cell lineage, um, or if you kept it on, what would happen? And actually, if we turn it on um, using a transgene in beta cells, um, it actually prevents maturation. So, so the beta, the animals actually end up getting diabetes. So I, I think, and OC1 is o, is um, overexpressed in the islets and DVDB mice. So I think. OC1 overexpression um, in what would be considered normally a mature beta cell is deleterious. So I do think it needs to be turned off. What Doris and I are thinking is that cooperation of PDX1 and OC1 early on establishes an epigenetic landscape that then can be realized later on when needed. And that if that isn't laid down to allow for beta cell differentiation and compensation later, that it, it can't happen later. You can't reestablish that landscape later. So what we're doing now is, is doing things like ATAC-seq and um, 4C and things like that to try and look more at the epigenetic landscape and, and look and see um, what the effect of this reduction in OC1 is. Um, for your second question, I agree. The DBDB model is not ideal. Um, and it, it could be something to do with the leptin receptor that we just can't overcome. Um, the other thing could be that we need to treat for longer, which is also possible. Um, so we're, we're starting to move now into some other models. So high fat diet model, um, the NOD model to look and see if there are other situations where if we could modulate EP3 activity 
that it might be beneficial in beta cell mass. So we're trying to move away from the DBDB model um, because we think that that something is, you know, it's not an accurate picture of type two diabetes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maureen, a question about the, the FOXM1, and so FOXM1 being a regulator of the DNA damage response, it makes a lot of sense that it would protect against streptozotocin. So do you propose that either cytokines or maybe in natural history, there's a mechanism of DNA damage to beta cells that's driving any form of diabetes? Hmm. Um, hmm. You know, we haven't looked a lot at DNA damage. We we did um, use that histone, what is it, H2 gamma X, or I, I always say it wrong, but um, we, sorry. Um, but we, we did look at that in, in the FOXM1 overexpressing animals, and we saw a reduction in expression of that. So we do think that it is protective against um, beta cell damage. Um, you know, we, I haven't probed it any further than that. Um, one, of the, one of the other things that we have found recently that I, I didn't show you is that the levels of PDX are, and this is why we think SPOP is important, um, is that the levels of PDX are, are really critical for beta cell proliferation. So PDX1 is, is critical for beta cell proliferation. If you, don't, if you knock out PDX1 in an adult beta cell, it doesn't proliferate. So it's important for that. Um, but what we found is that there's a window of expression. So if you have too little or too much PDX, the beta cells don't proliferate. So we think that this S-POP, you know, would ubiquitinate PDX and cause some degradation. And that sets kind of like the sweet spot of the, the level of PDX that's needed for normal proliferation. When we have elevated PDX artificially, if we overexpress it, what we're seeing is an increase in DNA damage. So we see upregulation of that gamma to whatever X thing that I can't say. Um, so my apologies to anyone who studies that. Uh, but so, so what we think is that um, there is kind of a sweet spot that maybe, you know, beta cells have to live within a certain window um, of compensation and that, you know, too much or too little is, is bad. So it's kind of a U-shaped curve, if that makes sense. But we haven't looked at um, FOXM1's role in regulating the DNA damage response other than what I've told you. Okay. So if you know more about that and there's things that you think that we should be looking at, I would love to hear that. Yeah, we can talk about that. I don't wanna monopolize your time. Let's see. So, oh yeah, I told you that. So do we have any additional questions? You know, some people had to run off to other meetings. Yeah, I think Mark had to go. <laughs> oh, is somebody asking a question? That, are you muted? I can't hear. Can you hear him? Oh, no, he's, he's not muted, but we cannot hear. If you'd oh. like to type your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, type it, yeah. <laughs> It is nice, Maureen. You get to see people that you've never, like Rohit, we see. I know. I know. It is really nice. Yeah. And I, yeah, I saw some other people who I think are gone now who are at Michigan. And um, so, yeah, that's really nice that you, that you opened it up to other people. I think that's great. All right. We're going to see it. Oh, here we go. Okay. You see Keto that? Okay. Yeah. Ketogenic diets have been looked at recently with regard to insulin resistance and beta selection. Any chance you are looking at this? Ah. So we are not currently looking at that. However, um, the postdoc that I just hired, so Karen Bosma, um, who was in our, our uh, photo at the end there, she actually has done ketogenic diet work in, in mice when she was a graduate student with Richard O'Brien and looking at its role in, um, in uh, G6P um, cycling, so, so glucose, cycling in the cells. So she worked on G6Pase too. 
Um, so that's something that we could definitely do. She has a lot of experience with that. Um, and so that that's something I think it's very interesting, but we have not looked at that. We've only looked at the standard high fat diet, but um, but she has experience with that and we she's working on this project. So she could certainly look at that. So thank you for that suggestion. All right, Maureen, thank you so much. All right, thank you all. Chronically. And I guess your next meeting is at two. So you'll, Maureen will negotiate you there. Yeah, I have the link for that and everything, yeah. All right, bye, Clay. Thank you. Thank you. Have okay.